Hello, and welcome to Unsheathed with your hosts, Kyle Gold and Cam Hirosaki. We hope that you enjoy the program. Please stick around afterwards. There'll be cake and blowjobs. Hi, welcome to Unsheathed number 71. I'm Kyle Gold. I'm Cam Hirosaki. And we're coming at you not live, recorded from our discreet mountain bunker in the Golden Coast. Yeah. Represent. Yep. <laughs> the land of Katy Perry and Snoop Dogg. <laughs> I wouldn't live anywhere else. By choice. And, <laughs> and, and MC Hammer. <laughs> right, right. And MC Hammer. But to sell all, like 17 of and, his cars. And Green Day. And Green Day. Apparently everywhere is Rodeo, California. <laughs> I don't know what that means. That's what he was saying during the concert. Oh, okay. Anyway. Um, Hello, real life. Yes. We're back. Um, so, it's been another exciting week of writing. Yeah. Cam is sampling something delicious over there, apparently, by the contortions his muscle's going through. Yeah, this is a 2001 Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon. Sorry, B-Hop, I know that you're like all anti-Napa, but this wine is delicious. Like, the moment the kit poured it, I could smell it from halfway across the bunker, and it's just like, oh, it smells so good. And it is. Of course, the air circulation system helps out with that. Oh, yeah. We have to shut it off for the podcast, but... Eh, you know. That's why we have to do it in under an hour, or else we suffocate. <laughs> yes, because all of our yammering will suck up all the oxygen in oh, the yes. bunker. The two of us especially. That's why Kate doesn't talk more. But yeah, no, it was an exciting week of running for me. I've actually like finally hit like a super good stride on Summerhill. Awesome. I credit some of that for the fact that uh, I just recently rewatched uh Misery, and I do so love a movie with a happy ending. <laughs> Well, fortunately, you're still here and not in some uh, house in Colorado in the clutches of your loving number one fan. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> glad glad to hear Summer Hill's been going better again. I'm sure all our listeners will also be glad of that. Yeah. I'm actually um, on to something now, I think. I've been writing away diligently with my little diligent fox paws on my own manuscript, and I posted something to Live Journal today, mm-hmm. introducing people to the world, if not quite the story at least i gave him the setup to the story yeah but there's an awful lot going on that i did not put in there and in fact one of the challenges that i'm running into right now is that i think i'm juggling i don't quite want to say too many plot lines but certainly more than i have in the past because i've got like four or five things going on at once and i will find that after writing sections that deal with two or three of them i'll come back and say oh yeah, I haven't talked about this one in a while. I hope nobody's forgotten about it yet. So I'm looking forward to going back through my first editing pass and kind of seeing um, how do I keep everyone's interest in all of them going without letting anything drop. You should send it to Don Ryu. He'll call you out on it. Will he? Well, apparently he did it, He did with Philip Pullman, if you remember. Oh, uh, well, yeah, Philip Pullman, his problem, though, was that like two or three of his plot lines in the final book just weren't interesting. So I'm... Hoping to avoid that pitfall. Well, if it turns out they're less interesting than you think, Don Rui will tell you, I'm sure. Yes, he was awesome. We actually had a great string of guests on the show for a while. and Yeah, I know. We're going to have to get you guys used to the fact that the show is really about us, too. Yes. Damn guests. That's why we're not having any for a while. They were too popular. <laughs> that bitch! Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Donovan's our friend. Yeah, I know. I don't want him to flip me. <laughs> ah, so let's see what Kit's got on our agenda for today. We have an upcoming live show at Fur Fiesta, which um, Kit told me he'd been working with someone there to arrange. And then when I mentioned it last week, he kind of gave me this wide-eyed look. But um, we're hopefully going to do a live show at at Furry Fiesta, if anybody on staff at Furry Fiesta is listening and does not know about it, please contact us. Say, Furry Fiesta staff told me we were doing it still. Okay, well, good. I mean, that was a few months ago, though, before um, I even knew I was going. Furry Fiesta staff told me I'm on one writing panel there, which is good. That's down 10 from Further Confusion, so... Oh, boy. Happy about that. I had one listener write in and say, Geez, Kyle, were you on every writing panel and then some? Good Lord. We couldn't <laughs> which, have been on then some. I could have. Oh, no, you were on the podcasting panel. I was on the podcasting panel. Um, 
but we're all excited to go back down to Dallas. It'll be our third year down there. In a row. <laughs> In a row. Yes. Um, we've been with them since the start. Yes, that was the very first Furry Fiesta was my first public convention appearance, too. That was. I remember that. Uh-huh. Our adult furry fiction panel. I know. We're, uh, are we doing that one again? I don't know. I don't think it's on the schedule. I, I hadn't committed myself to any panels because I wasn't sure until like a week ago that I was even going. All right, and see if we can sort of yeah. if you wanna slide you, something in late at night. Yeah, if you want to just slip me in there with you. <laughs> yeah, we'll see if they can accommodate two at once. Uh, that sounds like the discussion we were having prior to the podcast. I know. Um, not related at all to the Bridges ebook. Anyway. We have uh, added one convention to our calendar for this year. At least I have. Um, Kit and I, for the last few years, have gone to Rocky Mountain FurCon, but it's it wasn't something that we had... Um, we always kind of say, yeah, we really want to go, and usually things work out so that we can, but um, we are putting it on our definite calendar for this year because they were kind enough to invite me as a guest of honor. I was going to say, you kind of have to go now. <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of committed. Um and I'll be there with Rukus, which is very exciting. Yeah. So, if you guys are going to be in Denver, August thirteenth to fifteenth, I think it is. Uh, I'm fourteenth sure. to sixteenth, maybe. Yeah. No wait. Uh, Saturday's the thirteenth, so twelfth to fourteenth. Mid August. Something like that. Whatever. The Ides of August. Yes. If you're in, that. if you can make it to Denver in the Ides of August, I will be there. We're hoping to do a podcast, perhaps, depending on. Hirosaki sounds availability. Yeah, see, I was all torn because, like, I was because I went to RMFC last year and I was thinking of giving it a skip this year, but like, now it's like I think it's already got one skip. That. Oh, that's true. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, they're going to do some fun stuff. I'm going to be at events, GOH dinners, and there's a free can cook panel that I have to go to, which you know, drag me to a panel where someone cooks for me and makes me sample food. Oh gosh. Yeah, I know. Um, and uh, we'll think of some other fun stuff to happen there. I'm trying to plan a little surprise. I'm um, hoping in a couple months oh, I'll yes, have... that one. You um, told me about that. Hoping in a couple months I'll have some more positive news about it. <laughs> positive. Positive. <laughs> no, it's not being drawn by Teasel. <laughs> um, Kate has written something here about character voice. Question and then a mark. question mark. <laughs> I think Kid, you weren't drinking wine until after the show. Was this about the thing I was talking about right before the podcast? I think it was part. It's in your hand, right? <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I can think is that I was talking about the new David Mitchell book, which I can't talk about too much uh, because Hirosaka San has not finished it yet. But no, um, I haven't. I figured out something cool about it that uh, David Mitchell did with character voice that I don't think he had done previously in any of his books. And I'm not sure if he planned the structure in order to be able to do that or if he just did that to take by taking advantage of the structure. But it's um it's basically it's something kind of cool. And it's something that I I okay. sort of did unintentionally well, intentionally, but um not to not to go into too much detail, but he demonstrates in that book a couple ways in which he alters a character's voice based on experiences. It's it's interesting to see in different sections of the book how the same character behaves differently and kind of just the whole way that he speaks and interacts with the world is different. So I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and when Colson was on, speaking of our guests, yes, he posed us a challenge. We were going to write a scene, a piece, the same scene. Yep. And we were going to write it in our own inimical style. Or is it inimitable? Or inequitable. <laughs> or, yeah. Um, Inexplicable. Intimate style. Uh, and then we were going to have our listeners and readers try to determine who'd written which. Yes. So our producer Wolf has set up a thing where next week, next episode because we've both finished our scenes. But next episode, we're going to have a couple guests on, um, and each one of them is going to read one of the scenes. We are not going to tell them who the authors are, and they are not going to tell you who the authors are, and we are not going to tell you. 
And then we are also going to post the scenes on, on the Unsheathed FA account uh, when we post the episode. So you guys will be able to vote on the FA submissions as far as who you think wrote which scene. I'm actually curious to see how this goes. And we will tally them up, and we will see whether we're as distinct as we think we are. What do you, what do you, how do you think? Or as indistinct. Do you have, do you have a, a prediction? I predict people will be able to guess it. Yeah, I, th- I think so, too. Um, although Coulson did make it uh, a little more difficult by not specifying that one of the characters dies horribly at the end of the scene. <laughs> uh, I'm going to rewrite mine now. <laughs> Uh, I thought the other funny thing was that um, yours, if I recall correctly, you said yours was f- and we did that independently. We came within like 50 words of each other. Well, now we're going to have to make edits because people can just do word counts when we post them. Ah, uh, well. Or we, can we cut that, or we can cut that line. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll figure something out. Maybe we'll just reverse it. Yeah, maybe you can do that. Yeah, bleep out the numbers. That'd be awesome. Can you do that? Yeah. All right. Yay, Kit. Wow, I didn't even think of that. I was like, as soon as you started saying it, I was like, oh, God, really? Like, You could have just said, no, no, it was the reverse. And then people wouldn't know. Um, so what else do we have coming up on Unsheathed? Well, uh, one of the, at some point in the near future, we're going to be having one of our famous uh, fellow otter guests, uh, Tube. Is it Tube or not Tube we're getting? I think it's... I, th- I think it's tube, or is it not tube? It's maybe Kit not. just said not tube. It's either it's tube Schro- or it's not tube. Schrodinger's tube. tube. Really, that's your tube. Yeah, it's the- <laughs> you have two choices. So it's tube or it's not. It's Schrodinger's yeah. tube. Uh, we'll go he with that. had a book just released uh, at For the Confusion, Smiley and the Hero. So we're going to have him. Yeah, or he didn't have it released by Not For a Planet. And uh, we may or may not have here to come here to talk about his book or not. Really, we can't call it not tube cast. <laughs> no, never. I think we'll get in trouble, especially with him. Yes. Um, but we always enjoy having not tube on the, on yes. the show. And especially when he has something to talk about. Uh, he's rightfully proud of his book. I'm very happy. I got the first officially sold copy from the table. Oh, did you? Well, I took advantage of being able to get into the dealer's room early to oh, right. snag it. You bitch. Yes. <laughs> Well, and Fuzzwolf wouldn't even let me have that. He was like, well, we already gave one complimentary copy away to Kooner, who did the art on it. And I was like, fine, I get the first officially sold copy. He's like, okay, well, I haven't set up the register yet. <laughs> I'm like, here's $10, give me a damn book. <laughs> Hi, Fuzz, we love you. So yeah, there's us coming out. It's only $10 if you want to read it. Yes. And we're going to do a pitch episode where Hirosaki and I discuss the difference between a pitcher and a catcher. Are we really? Wow. Apparently so. Uh, I thought I already went over on the podcast how gay people don't say that. Yeah, well, you know, for those for those young and impressionable listeners who want to know how to correct their straight friends when they use those terms. Uh, non-gay, non-furry listening audience, right? Like just as like a joke, I was like, I don't know about you, but I'm a shortstop. And then I realized if you tried to like make that into something sexual, it actually sounds really bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm done. <laughs> Leaving now awkwardly. I play left field. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you rather be like the equipment manager? Yeah. Um. Okay, kids making like frantic hand gestures at me so pitch episode is when like people write in their story pitches of oh call in over skype right kid's gonna make that technological magic work and we give people oh right 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 right. we're gonna give two people two minutes to make their pitch we're gonna have our timer weasel back and he would cut them off at two minutes and uh and then we would uh make fun of them or talk about no seriously discuss their pitch right exactly of course as we always would um, as is our want. <laughs> I'm here to do Algernon from The Importance of Being Earnest. Great. How original. <laughs> <laughs> Are you the one who did the whole episode of CSI at the audition? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> anyway. I wrote this story about this wolf who goes to school and meets this other wolf. <laughs> Sorry. 
<laughs> now, now, don't revise your pitches now, folks. Don't ruin their pitches before they put them in. Oh, they don't need my help. Um, so that's what's coming up. We got exciting things planned. Uh, more guests, more fun, more different things. We're going to do another editing challenge episode with uh, the hacksaw rat at some point in the future when we can uh, all arrange our schedules. Um, it's just mostly a matter of me going into the email queue and picking out a sample to send around and then scheduling a time. Um, so we got a couple uh, couple news things going on here and then a few letters to get to. So here, yeah. here's Hirosaki-san with the news. There, there's an interesting one here. Uh, Amazon.com has finally reported uh, that with his latest earnings that uh, Kindle books are outselling paperback books. Uh, they had previously been selling outselling hardcover, but you know hardcover books for those of you who don't know are like usually really expensive, so that wasn't too surprising. But now it's apparently you know for every hundred paperbacks they're selling 115 books on the Kindle, and uh, now they're theorizing that by 2014 uh, eBooks will account for half of all book sales, which is kind of interesting. And um, I was having a discussion with someone this week about. Uh, the future of publishing, which is mm-hmm. a topic on many people's minds these days, um, and they're saying once ebooks become more common, the publishing model is going to have to change. Yeah, I mean you're still going to have some print books, but when as people figure out that they can quite easily get their own ebooks up onto the web, yeah, um, we're going to see kind of a different model where you're going to count more on reviewers and content aggregators and filter sites to point you to what to read as yeah. opposed to the publishers being acting as the reviewer and filter and aggregator. And the reviewers, um, for their part, are going to have to look around at a lot of different sources and try to find a different way to get uh, material. Gas, yes, people are going to have to figure out what's actually worth reading. Uh. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and then, like, the other thing that I, I, again, like, I hear this a lot, and, like, it's even in this article here, where, like, oh, like, some people are saying, like, in 10 years, like, you know, brick-and-mortar bookstores are going to be gone, and I don't think that's true no, I don't at either. all. I think that that's alarmist and kind of BS. <laughs> I mean, like you said, I think the publishing model will certainly have had to change, but, you know, for as many millions of people have, like, you know, Kindles and other ebook readers, many millions of more people don't. <laughs> Right. I mean, so... <laughs> I mean, although, you know what people said when iTunes first started getting popular, that there would soon be no more places where you can buy CDs, and, you know, yeah. those places are all gone now, right? Yeah, they're gone completely. Yeah. No what's, can, what's a CD? Nowhere you can walk into a store Is and buy a magic? CD anymore. Was that like a cash-on-delivery? Ooh. I want my Ginsu it's knives, damn it. It's a certificate of deposit. Oh. C- collect on delivery, COD. Mm. Um, it's a kind of delicious fish <laughs> have faith in cod <laughs> yes another interesting thing uh, as regards ebooks and we should point out that we are not yet getting sponsored by Amazon though if anyone there has a lead to whether Amazon would like to sponsor us we're certainly open to that um, interestingly enough um, even though there are approximately Let's say the, the report here, this is um, published a weekly article, the Codex survey, a, a survey by, uh, sorry, what are they called? Codex, the Codex Group. Um, Apple has already sold over three times more iPads in just nine months than Amazon is estimated to have sold Kindles in three years. Amazon, of course, does not release its sales figures the way Apple does. Um, but the ebook market is still heavily favoring Amazon. And in fact, the percentages among iPad owners, more iPad owners get their ebooks from Amazon's Kindle store than get it from Apple's iBook store. 48% to 29%. It's like, you know, when they used to offer things on beta and VHS. Right. I remember that. Yeah. Um, the interesting thing is, uh, and we were having this discussion yesterday with someone about the Kindle. Uh, as I think I've mentioned, I got a Kindle for Christmas, which is awesome, and I love it. And the person we were talking to said, you know, I don't think the Kindle's going to survive because nobody wants a dedicated machine that all it does is read ebooks. You're going to have tablets and stuff like iPads and whatnot. But actually what I found is the reason I like the Kindle is it doesn't do anything else. 
And that means that yeah. when I'm on the Kindle, I don't get instant messages. I don't have the temptation to browse the web and look for, you know, read my favorite blogs or, you know, go to Furfinity and browse for porn or, you know, whatever else I do when I'm online. I don't, I can't go work on my own writing because I'm not I on my computer. I have a machine that does that already. Right. It's called my computer. And, uh, you know, I had some, some uh, stuff that I was reading for some friends and it went very slowly on the computer because they were in big PDFs and they were kind of cumbersome to read in Adobe and yeah, it was just a uh, pain. Uh, I sent it to the Kindle and finished it in like a week. There you go. And I think uh, that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about the Kindle is it's a it's a really good reading experience that is not duplicated on the computer. Yeah, I hate reading things off of computers myself. Like, um, I've put unless the stuff, I have to. I've put the stuff for the writing group, the last parts of Summerhill I put on the Kindle, and hmm. it reads really well. Oh, well, that means I wrote it okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you were talking about the way it flows on the screen. <laughs> I was talking about both. Um, so it's interesting. If... Um, I know I posted like last late last year there was some stuff with Amazon removing stuff from the store and all that but you know by and large they're a pretty good shop my overall impression of them is pretty favorable still yeah and you know for all the people who thought that the Kindle was going to crash and burn when it first came out uh it's a pretty successful device so so ha huh? <laughs> so there you have it uh and I I would add sort of anecdotally I think I've only seen like one or two requests from people to have my um, books put on the iBook store. Mostly I see, can you have it on Kindle, can you have it on Nook? And that's that's about it. A couple people said, can you have it on the Kobo store? And I'm working on that. They are having technical difficulties, which prevents them from getting back to me, but I have the files almost all ready to send them. So once they get their end sorted out, I'll have those books up. And I've been playing around with other Kindle stuff, which Kit is trying to tell you about, but hopefully the mic didn't pick up. Um, but I'll I'll... I'll have that announcement pretty soon. Actually, I already mentioned it, but that's okay. They can wonder. Uh, do you want to start the letters, or do you want me to? I'll give you the, the uh, option. I can start if you want. All righty. All right. Greetings, fine furry fellows. It's Maguzi again. I'm sorry for sending another email so soon after the last. Oh, that's please. okay. We didn't read it that soon. Yeah. I was thinking about something that I'd like your opinion on. I've made it to the early 20s in the podcast. Oh, we were so young back then. So if you've already answered something like this, then I apologize. I would like to pick your brains about character names. In my own writing, I tend to use temporary names based on people I know or characters I've used before in roleplay and such with the intention of choosing more appropriate names later. But I wonder if this is a mistake. English teachers, for example, make it a point to drive home the importance of the names an author gives their characters. It seems like a name should be as important to a character as their personality, and I tend not to write a character unless I know their personality first. I was thinking about out of position as I was pondering this topic. Devlin is a rather unique name in and of itself, but his nickname, Dev, is of particular interest. As a geeky wolf, I can't help but think of Dev as short for development, as in in development. It's amusing to think of Lee as developing Dev's sexual preferences in the same way that a software engineer develops their code. Well, you are a geek. So do you spend a lot of time coming up with character names in your stories? Is this something you decide on right away, or do you use placeholders at first? Do you make an effort to come up with any special meanings? Anyway, thank you again for your time and make, for making such a wonderful podcast. One day I hope to see one of your live shows, or at least meet you in person. Until then, best regards. I look forward to more of your writing. Maguzi. Hey, Maguzi. Uh, good question, actually. It is a good question. And um, I I would love to take credit for the dev thing. Uh, one of the things you learn in at uh, looking in movies is how sort of brashly in your face the character names are. We were having this discussion yeah. over the weekend, I think. Um, and the example we pulled out was The Truman Show. Oh, right. Where Ed Harris's character who created the show is named Kristoff, mm -hmm. as in Christ of. Yes. And at, I thought he was named after, like, the architect. No. <laughs> and, and at one point, yeah, and at the one point when he's addressing Truman, he, he says, I am the creator, and pauses, of a oh, television, television show. show. Yes. Um, and True Man is True Man. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know... Yeah. So there's all that stuff a, going a, on. A big recent one is uh, in the movie Inception, the right. character Ariadne. 
Right. Because Ariadne right. is the woman who leads Theseus out of the labyrinth back in right. Greek myth. And so right, right. She's the... Yes, form your own conclusions. <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, character names. Dev, I think to the extent that it does fit in that way, which, I, I as I say, I would love to take credit for, um, I think it was largely subconscious um, because I... I work not necessarily as a software engineer, but I work in the high tech world, so I'm familiar with things like dev environments, uh-huh. um, dev platform, as a place where you try things out and you know sort of figure out how the final product's going to look. And so I think for the first book, subconsciously, I probably associated his character with that nickname, Lee. I'm not sure quite how that came about. Otherwise, other than that. I just wanted a name that would work for both a man and male and female, and I didn't want to use the typical Pat or Chris. Actually, my my Terry. favorite my favorite male female or gender neutral name is Sydney. Oh, that's a good one. Um, Robin also works. Robin is another one of my favorites. <laughs> and Sue, <laughs> but that's just for Johnny Cash fans. <laughs> yeah. um, unless unless Brian is short for like Brian Sue <laughs> or Brian <laughs> Rietta. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, if you've watched the recent Sherlock series. Yes, yeah. Harry. Um, Lee was kind of a good generic male-female name, and I don't know how else to say, but it fit the character. Yeah, it like, does fit. if he was named Pat. No. That would be very different. I that think I, I would well. be torn between thinking of It's Pat and Pat Morita, neither of which yeah. is right. Um, But... Pat Riley. <laughs> well, how how do you come up with names, and then I'll I'll talk about mine. Oh, how do I come up with names? <laughs> this is such a loaded question because there are so many different ways I do it. Um, sometimes a oh n- otters. Yes, sometimes a name will just come to me, and I'll decide I need to use it, and I'll try to like base a character on the name. <sighs> a lot of times, I will just sort of try to find a name that has like a certain image to it either like uh, it's really like it's like this metaphysical intangible thing that goes on through my head I'm trying to figure out a way to explain it and I'm trying to come up with a good example okay so like for example Summerhill like that's his name uh, of the like that's the main character's name for those of you who haven't caught on about how I keep talking about this I I think the reason that that was the name I came up with. And it really was. I came up with the idea for the story before I came up with the character's name. But I wanted something that was like this, you know, bright, evocative name because he comes from this drab and dreary place. But, you know, he himself is a much more sort of colorful personality. And, you know, that was just sort of what came to mind when I was trying to think of a name. And it kind of fits his personality, yeah. too. Because he's, he's very bright and, yeah. and cheery, like a summer hill. Yeah, there you go. Kind of. I didn't name him after development in New Jersey. That, that was not what I was doing. <laughs> um, so if you want to look at the one, at one of my names that's really like, well, I'll, okay, I'll give you two that are kind of heavily planned out and fraught with meaning. Um, go look up Samaki mm-hmm. and go look up Streak's real name on the web yes. under baby names. Uh, both of those have um, specific meanings that I chose because of the characters. But most of the time, like, so the, that short story that I showed you just recently, mm-hmm. which is probably just going to go up to the web, has two characters in it, and I named them um, Rex and Davy. And Davy... I gave the diminutive to because he's sort of the more junior character. Rex was given sort of the more senior name because he's more of a dominant character. And you do these kinds of things because the names fit the characters. So as you're thinking about what's this character going to be named, um, you know, I didn't think, well, I'll have this, the guy who's the more dominant of the pair. He's older and he's the one taking the other one in. And I'm going to call him... Um, Jimmy. Yeah. And it doesn't quite work. Apologies to all the Jimmys out there who are old and wise and take people in and, you know, treat them good and whatnot, but... 
You could for name, the purposes you could of name him Saint Jimmy. You know, that's why life is not fiction. I could, but then I would have had to put him in a fishnet vest and dye his hair black. Yeah. <laughs> Which um, hey, could could work. It could, not for this particular story. No. So yeah, mostly mostly I just make up names. Uh one of the things that actually I had a thought on this week while we have uh you know, Comcast music stations which have all kinds of names pop up on them from pop stars and whatnot. Um, I was just thinking that kind of the furry the furry trend and the larger internet trend of making up unique names for yourself because I, I sort of I bounce around between that like I'll put some names in stories that are like Steve and Mike and I don't use Steve Dave no but I'll use sort of conventional names but then I'll also do other ones where I make up names like out of position there's both kinds Devlin is kind of a made up name although it is a real name yeah um Wiley is also mostly kind of a made up name but it's such a cute um, name it is it is a good one and that also was designed to fit the character yeah um okay so he's uh, a little too much Wiley for his own good you'll, you'll, you'll get another quick little Summer Hill spoiler here one of the other main characters in Summer Hill uh, is named Catherine, and it's very telling. Well, at least I like to think it is that you know she's not Kathy, she's not Kate, she's always Catherine. Right. And you know that right there should you know tell you something about you know like you know if that's her preferred form of address. Like there's you know that says something about the character's personality, especially because like, you were saying there with like Davy. Like there's a deliberate diminutive in there. Right. Exactly. And there's you know very much not one there. And like I remember. Like I was talking to Foosball and about a draft of Summer Hill I had sent him, and he was he was calling her Kathy like on purpose, like because he was like, "Oh, Kathy, you you know such and such," and like it's and just it sort of like changes yeah. how you look at the character. exactly yeah. Um, but anyway, I was looking at a lot of the pop stars and people who are becoming famous now, and I think there's a growing trend towards naming both naming your children things that are kind of a little eccentric and unique. Um, even if the only way you can think of to do that is to take a traditional name and stick Y's in it, and yeah, or, adopt or an, join you know the, the the rhyming trend of like you know Aiden, Braden, Jaden, Caden, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or people like who need to adopt a name, adopt a, a kind of unique name, um, which uh, interestingly enough, I think one of our later questions is about. Huh? They're about how we chose our names. Yeah. Well, and uh, it is kind of funny if you look up Kyle spelled the way I spell it uh, on the internet. I'm pretty much the only one out there using it. I think there was someone on MySpace, but I don't. I believe he actually took his name from you. Did he? Because the last name he uses is King, which I'm pretty sure comes from Stephen King. Wow. He's a furry. Yeah. Oh, I, know, okay. I, know, I know. I know. I know who that is. So I'm pretty sure he got it from you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'm just going to be worried if in, like... It's the sincerest form of flattery. Yeah, I was just going to say, I'm going to be worried if in, like, 15 or 16 years I start running into a bunch of fans of my work called Kyle. Yeah. It's like, you know, when people started naming their kids, like, Delenn and Jadzia. Uh, hey, about the, the first person who writes in and says that they named their kid Kyle or KM, you can come and be a guest on our podcast. If we have any listeners... That's your prize. If we have any listeners that are having children, I want to know, so I can... Oh, you never know. Uh, real that's, quick, that's, about, that's a standing yeah. offer if the podcast is yeah. still going. Real quick about his subject here about using placeholder names. I tend not to do that for the simple reason that as soon as I get into the habit of thinking of a character under a certain name, I can't change it again afterwards. I have. I've. Not I'm really used, bad at that. I've not used placeholder names, but I have gotten a good ways into a manuscript and then decided that a name was not quite right for a character mm. and changed it. Um, actually in Waterways, Corey's mother's name changed a couple times because she's Celia now, right? She's Celia now. She used to be Virginia. I think she was Virginia originally. And then I was like, that's a little too unwieldy and a little too on the nose. Yeah. Um, but Shadow, did I change someone in Shadow? Uh, I, I actually changed someone who's not in the book, but whom they talk about in the book. Uh, I changed his name, but only... I changed one letter in his name from an E to an I and apparently forgot to do it in every instance in the book. So, uh, Oh, well. 
Uh, should we move on to our yeah, super long letter? I hope that covers that. That was a really... It was cool. It was a nice discussion, I think. Um, all right. This letter's from Welsh. He writes, Questions. Otherwise, quite feverish. However, feverish wouldn't be the right word itself. Let's stay on topic now. Quantity, quality. Much different things now, aren't they? There's a split between those who write furry and those who write anthropomorphic animals. Much more, the idea of talking furry animal people were still quite popular back in the dark ages of alt chat rooms, alt dot chat rooms, and the only chance you had at seeing another talking dragon is if you drove six miles to a sci fi convention. Yet, despite this, I see among the new age of the internet, we've seen a split in talking animal people. Furries and published science fiction authors both give us the luxury of anthros, but in varying degrees. First off, Kyle, if you're listening in on this too, or reading it, <laughs> there is an obvious market for the two. One, at, one, one of which would enjoy the furriness more than the other. This is when we get books like Deathless, Thousand Leaves, and Out of Position. Then there are books like Watership Down, the Shulin Alliance series, the Chanor series, Gun with Occasional Music, and the Moreau series. These aim at the readers who probably get a kick out of Wolfmen, but also probably never even heard of furries in the first place. Uh, I'm going to break into the letter here for a little bit. Watership Down, yes. Shulin Alliance, I'm not familiar with. You no, know I'm not either. Uh, Channer series. I've heard of that. Um, Channer series is borderline. Yeah. Most furries know about it. Most of the fans of the Channer series probably know about furry, although I wouldn't swear to that one. Yeah, that's on the cusp because that's like, that's pretty like geeky sci-fi yeah. at that point. Gun with occasional music is not. It has a furry character, but it's not a furry book. Um, there's a kangaroo in it. Okay. And the Moreau series is definitely very furry. Yeah. Um, as Andrew Swan has been to conventions. Yeah. And his book was actually passed around to us at Rainforest last year. Yeah, that's right. I remember that. Let's um, move on. Why am I comparing fandom to mainstream? It should be sort of obvious by now. Anthros have always been mainstream, but they're a niche thing nowadays. I don't know if Anthros have always... They've no. always been kind of on the fringe of mainstream. I, 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 I have a lot to say about this. I keep reading... Unless they're on all fours and in the latest Disney or Pixar film, folks nowadays are probably going to connect this as being a nerd thing. Nerdy in the aspect of that furries used to have such a strong presence in the science fiction community, unlike today, even though the idea of mature anthros have not been as niche as it used to be now. Um, though getting to the point, will we ever have a furry Neil Gaiman or Terry Pratchett? Um, how mainstream do you think you can get as a writer? Either of us. How mainstream do you think you can get as a writer who happens to like using animal people? Will we ever have a furry Harry Potter or Star Wars? I decided this is a larger question than a single answer can deliver. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm sort of paraphrasing the rest of the question is, um, what are the chances of furry books hitting the mainstream, getting a publisher, and in a year or so seeing actual books by actual publishers in our local Barnes & Noble? Um, furries will not be mainstream, but can we have... Um, furries writing well enough to bleed into the mainstream world of books. Um, and the way he puts it here is nice. Do you think we writers in a community focused on our passion of animal people could have talent that could be applied to the real world and be loved just the same? I'm not sure if this road is paved with gay furry stories or not, but it's definitely something far off in the expressway we haven't quite reached yet. Um, food for thought, eh? Welsh. Okay. I have two main points I want to bring up here. One, as we've discussed on the podcast before, the label of furry is very much a matter of self-identification. The reason that, you know, like you said, like out of position and thousand leaves are furry is because the people who wrote them call them furries, call themselves furries. The reason that, you know, Watership Down and, you know, stuff like that isn't is because the people who wrote them don't call themselves that. And, you know... But, you know, furries will say, yes, Watership Down is a furry book. Yes, Pride of Shannara is a furry book. And the distinction is whether it was created within the fandom or created outside the fandom, and then, you know, people within the fandom find it and enjoy it because of what it is. I don't know if Watership Down is a furry book. Uh, I would say it's a book furries enjoy. Well, but it's, I'm about, sure. it's about talking sentient animals. I mean, they, they, but, they don't walk on two legs, but they're still anthropomorphic. But I think a, a point that I've, I've kind of thought about a bit, and I think I addressed on the podcast at one point, is, or maybe it was in one of the panels, um, there is a distinction between um, furry books 
and anthropomorphic animal books. There's a kind of sensibility, and the reason that I've seen this is um, in talking to some of the people from outside the fandom who have tried to publish stories in the fandom, uh, both books and short stories, um, you see them kind of approaching it. They don't quite get it. No, they don't. That's true. And, I mean, Watership Down, Watership Down is more like, honestly, it's more like a Tolkien book than it is like a furry book. That's true. Because it's not if it's like, hey, what if rabbits were people? It's, hey, what if rabbits? Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, seriously. No, no, no. You're right. No. You're absolutely right. And there's a there's a lot of what um, I, I took a, a class way, way back when about the culture of science fiction and science fiction fandom. Um, and there's discourses, basically, that spring up around a lot of different things. There's a huge discourse in the science fiction fandom about war mm -hmm. and battles and battle armor, and battle weapons, and attitudes, and all that. And all of these stories that are written about war in science fiction fandom are aware of the previous landmarks, the Heinleins, the Haldemans, the Asimovs, all the, the authors that have treated war. Right. And they, even if they don't specifically use the language of war that those books used, they write with an awareness of what's been written before. Right. Um the books that are furry write with an awareness of what it means to be using furry characters. Chenner, I would say, is yeah, is borderline yeah, because they are furry characters, but they're treated very much as alien, and there's little sympathy, from what I recall, for from the alien point of view. And the furry sensibility is either it's a world completely populated by furries with no humans, which so far I think I've really only seen in the furry fandom. Mm -hmm. Or it's a world where there are furries and humans, and the overriding sentiment is furries are on an equivalent level with humans, and you're supposed to be generally supposed to be sympathetic with the furries. And I will freely admit that my new project, which has furries and humans in it, has that sensibility as well. But you also have a lot of that sort of thing where you're talking about, oh, like, furries as something that is alien and different. If you look at early furry fandom, that was also a sentiment that was carried through yeah. really strongly. Whereas, like, you know, like, you know, we're not like people. Like, we're really different. Whereas now it is sort of like, hey, we're basically people with, you know, ears and tails. Well, you know, well not... But not to whitewash it. Right. Exactly. We're different types of people. But it, the the alien separation isn't a draw point. It's not, it's not a sticking point like it was. Right. Um, but yeah. And so that sort of leads into my point number two, because I said I had two points. Uh, it's important to remember that furry is not a genre. If anything, it's like a meta genre. It's a... It's a something you can, you know, tack onto a pre existing thing. You know, you have like genres like, you know, like romance, fantasy, like fantasy, military sci fi. Yeah. <laughs> that you could do that too. Like, you know, military sci fi. Yeah, you know, that sort of thing. But, and, but you can have, you know, like furry romance, furry fantasy, furry military sci fi. You're not changing the genre. You're just adding a layer onto it. And, you know, you can do what you will with that. You can make the differences between the different species really intrinsic to the plot. You can make it sort of like a cosmetic spackle. That doesn't affect the actual genre of what you're telling. I mean, like, and that and if I think is one of the things that makes it so difficult to sell to the mainstream. Right, exactly. Because like you're saying, it's like if you don't get why it's intriguing, that's the thing. And that's why it's like, oh, like when are we going to be mainstream? It's like I don't think that's the point. The people, like we are the people who want to read this sort of thing. Right. I mean, like it's sort of like, hey, like I wrote this book. It's about you know like these like you know two races that are like at war with like these like you know interstellar you know battle fleet. Oh, and like they happen to look like like bipedal animals. You know, we are the audience for that. I mean, the plain and simple. You know, and when when you how did you find the furry fandom? You went online, probably said, "I want to read stuff that has stuff about animals," and you found us. Like this is us. I think that like, people just need to accept that. Like we're that, and well, that's not a bad thing. No, and I totally agree with that. I think more to the point, what he's getting at and I do have an answer for it, 
is, well, okay, he's getting at a couple things. First of all, I feel like within his question, one one of the things he's trying to say is, will there ever be a shelf at Barnes & Noble marked furry? And I think the answer to that is no. Yeah, I would agree. With a but. <laughs> and <laughs> you said but. Yeah. Sorry. Go on, please. <laughs> As uh, as the Reverend Lovejoy once said to Lisa, well, short answer, yes, with an if, long answer, no, with a but. Mm-hmm. Um, I do believe the furry fandom is growing and continues to grow yes. year after year after year. And I do think there are more and more people who are, uh, again, I hate to keep bringing up parallels with gay people, but from a distance, furry fandom is... It's so weird. Why are you walking about? Why are you writing about walking, talking cats and dogs? Yeah. But when you get close up to it, you say, "Oh, this is kind of cool." And you know, there are people, and we've talked to a couple people who are kind of like, "I just don't get it, and I don't like it. I've read it, and I don't like it." Yeah. And you're like, cool. Well, and there's always going to be people like that. So, I could potentially conceive of there being enough volume. To where, like, like what happened with anime and manga? Yes. To where there would be a small section of books, and it would be kind of like, well, yeah, these appeal to furries, and you know, we'll publish a few of them. Honestly, if the mainstream publishers think they can make a few bucks publishing furry books, then they will publish furry yeah. books. Right now, the fandom is small enough that they are not going to make those those bucks publishing plain furry books. Yeah. The other part of his question is, is there going to be a furry Harry Potter? Or, what was the other one? Star Wars. Star Wars. Star Wars. Um, and that, I think, is not a function of the furry fandom. No. I mean, Harry Potter was a huge success and far outsold any other young adult fantasy book. Ever. Yeah. The, the young adult fantasy audience were not the only people buying Harry Potter. Right. So I think what you're asking is... Yeah, and not just science fiction nerds are into Star Wars. Right. Everyone's pretty much seen Star Wars. Exactly. You know? um, so I think what you're asking is, will there be a writer, or will there be, I should say, will there be a work from the furry fandom that can have that kind of broad appeal? Um, and again, I would say probably no. Yeah. But... I'm amused that the two authors he mentions are Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett. I want to be like, you do realize only nerds read Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett? Yeah. Right? I, I was going to say, I mean... <laughs> yeah, but Neil, they're still nerdy. Terry, Terry Pratchett They're not has, like Dan Brown. Terry Pratchett has a bit more of a following. Yeah. Um, Neil Gaiman is kind of famous cross-genre because he's yeah. done movies and his, you know... But his geek cred is super high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of like citing Will Wheaton as a mainstream yeah. author. Yeah. It's like... Um, yeah. It's like, yeah, I can kind of see where you think that because he's one of the most popular yeah. geek authors. Yeah. But and you're no. a geek. We're geeks. I'm a geek. Um, but my my sort of response to that Harry Potter thing is, okay, you cite Harry Potter and Star Wars as big examples of genre breaking yeah. works. How many more examples of that like that can you think of? Yeah. Because like Tolkien maybe. Yeah. The, the thing you have to also take into account is not only are like Harry Potter and Star Wars like examples of like you know book series and film series that were like, you know, major. They were also cultural phenomena. Right. And that's that is what sets them apart is that they went beyond just a series of books and just a series of movies. They are a, they are now ingrained in culture. They are things that like, literally everyone in our culture knows and understands. And, I mean, I would not put Twilight up on their level. No. Um, and, you know, I like, would... Yeah. I would not... Jesus. Yeah, like, I wouldn't put Discworld down no, as a no, bit no, no. of cultural phenomenon. I'm trying to think of Lord of the Rings, and I think... Lord I of the Rings have, comes close. I would not have put Lord of the Rings there until the movies. Yeah. I think the movies made the, made that series it, very it hit accessible the, it, to it, people. It, it, it hit a saturation point that you can make, like, a Lord of the Rings joke on, like, a, you know, primetime sitcom, and most of your audience will get it. Um, Star Trek? Yes. Also a cultural phenomenon. But the point is, if you look at it, these kind of phenomena come around once every... 10, 20 Decade, years, yeah. something like that. And so, given that 
the furry fandom is as small as it is, given the barriers. I mean, if someone in the furry fandom writes a book that is as... I, I keep going round and round on this, because part of the problem is a publisher is going to look at a furry book and say, people aren't going to pick this up. But if you write a furry book that the publisher says, wow, even though it's furry, people are going to pick this up, then they'll publish it. Right. And so really... But then people are buying it because it's a good book and not because it's quote-unquote furry. Right. And you have circumvented the entire point you were trying to make. And so your question is kind of out of yeah. the out of the hundreds of millions of people writing books and creative works in the world, um, some 0.1% of which are furry, 0.01% of which are furry, what are the odds that the one cultural phenomenon or the two cultural phenomena that are going to come around in the next 20, 25 years will be from the furry fandom, well, you know, do the math. Yeah. and Odds it, I, are no. Yeah. It, odds, it, but you know what? And, like, I, I'm i actually... This is, like, a subject I'm actually... As you can probably tell from how animated I am talking about it, I actually... I am very, you know, intellectually, you know, invested and passionate about this. And I really think that, you know, like I said we are the audience for this sort of thing. I don't see anything wrong with trying to produce works of literature by us for us. We don't, like, I don't see it as people like, oh, like, we have, like, these, like, furry things, like, oh, like, we need to hit the mainstream. It's like, well, considering that the biggest fans of this type of, you know, craft are us, why shouldn't we write it with us in mind? Why should we try to make something that will hit mass appeal when we can write something that is designed specifically to have furry appeal? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. The only thing I think that is wrong with that is if you say, I don't need to make this a better book because the furry audiences will settle for a mediocre Oh, one. no, that's not what I mean at all. And as I've said on the show before, as you know, I have the point I always keep trying to make is we are the only people who will hold us to a higher standard. Exactly. And and we should be doing that. And that is why you and I do this show. Thank you, Pyro. <laughs> um Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I will I will say just because we're on here being all depressing about the mainstream's never gonna embrace furry fiction, we're never gonna have a furry Harry Potter, we're never gonna have a furry Star Wars, we're never gonna have a furry section in the Barnes and Noble, does not mean that you should not pull out every single goddamn stop in your writing arsenal to make the best book you can. Yeah. Because if you don't do that, if you believe that there's no chance you will hit the mainstream and you just yeah. settle for second best, then you never will. Every time you sit down to write something, try to make it the best thing you've ever written. And the next thing you write, try to make it better than that. What was the, what's the saying? How's the saying go? Shoot for mediocrity and you'll hit it every time. Exactly. Should I move on to the next email, Kyle? Let's do it. We got right. a bunch of questions in it, which we may have to kind of lighten and round, even though we don't have our time no, or here. I can lighten and round. This is cool. Yeah. Hey there, Sheathers. I appreciate the advice you gave in episode 63. Of course, once again, it came a bit late, but your advice ended up being exactly what it, what exactly happened. When I finished the or story, like I knew that. that it was the end. Like I said before, there are plenty of scenes ready to be chopped up and changed, and perhaps I need to add in a scene or two. I'm happy that I managed to complete NaNoWriMo with over 50,000 words, and I must say that the lessons learned in the story are more than well thought out, I, that I had originally anticipated. So now I'm going to put the novel on the shelf until winter break when I have more time to work on it. Good job. It's good to know that you can look at your work objectively like that. Indeed. Since I don't want this email to be just about a thank you and an update, I might as well put in some questions. Big Alrighty, big. let's go. First, how many times do you edit a story before you come out with a finished product? I'm still new to the whole editing phase, considering the people enjoyed my stories when I just wrote them and posted them, even though I thought they were uh, mindless. Even though they were mindless reads, I know that my novel needs to be edited a few times before it's finished and ready to be put out there, but I don't want to uh, under edit it or over edit it. For example, how many times did you edit out of uh, position or isolation play? Uh, out of yeah. position was kind of a weird case because it was several stories, and I. I edited the short stories as they came out and then I edited the whole thing uh, probably two or three times. Yeah. Uh, isolation play, I want to say went through like five edits. I did one, um, yeah. writing group did one, foosball did one. I did another one. Um, kitten, you kitten, you did another one. Uh, I don't remember. I lost count. Uh, yeah. short answer as many times as it needs to be. If you find yourself just making small fiddly changes in it, then it's probably time to get it out the door. Yeah, I mean, novels and short stories are different. If you write a short story, you're probably good. Okay, write it once, go back and edit it. You probably don't need to rewrite a short story. 
uh, yet <laughs> like the deadlines will certainly put into mind where okay you're done editing you need to have something that's finished uh, Summerhill I wrote it I, re- I, I wrote it, I edited it, I rewrote it, I'm currently rewriting it again, and then when I'm done rewriting it, I'll probably have to go edit it at least once, if not a few more times. So, you know, it varies, but, you know, you sort of, you, you develop a feel for it. And I know you said you're new to it, but, you know, for your novel, I would expect a rewrite and maybe, like, a couple of editing passes. That sounds about fair. Yeah, generally, I would say between two and five. <clears throat> if you're doing If you're doing more than five edits, then you're probably... Either over, unless you completely like rehash the story like you did, you're probably overthinking it. Yeah. Second, have you ever had a novel length story, but after editing it, finding it to be a lot shorter than it had been originally? No. I know, yeah, no. I know that Cam had a story going from shorter length all the way to novel length, which many people are patiently awaiting its arrival. It's coming. But have either of you had it the other way around? Yeah, no. No. That's never been a problem. <laughs> Third, why did you pick pen names that sound real as opposed to furry names like White Yoda or Fuzzwolf? There's nothing wrong with furry names, of course, but why did you pick names that sound more like more human like like Kyle or Hirosaki? Um you know because yeah, that's just the name I picked. I don't think I was thinking that far ahead. Um yeah, I kind of just I wanted it to sound like a an author's name. Yeah. I mean, I have a furry name that isn't KM Hirosaki. This is my erotic writing pen name. And so I picked like, oh, I need a pen name. So there you go. Boom. Right. Like, yeah, I'm pretty sure Fuzzwolf was always just Fuzzwolf. Yeah. Know? I don't know the key. Same with White Yudi. Yeah. And hey, Pyro's Ernest Effing Hemingway or something now. So <laughs> that's kind of human sounding. Finally, have you ever used a stereotype as a base for a story? I've had certain questions asked to gay guys many times. Do you turn yourself on? <laughs> I had a f- somebody ask one of my friends who was into Vore if they got turned on by eating, and they just looked at them like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever been asked. Now, if you were a robot, I could see someone asking you that. Yeah. It's just like, and I was considering using it for a short story. I've seen stories like that before, but I wanted to give my own shot at it and see where it goes. Have you guys ever done something like this? Yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, I have um, a story I wrote called Pop Music is Not a Crime, which basically plays with the idea that, you know, hey, you're at the club and you see, like, the cute, twinky gay fox, and, oh, yeah, you're going to go, you're going to hit on him, and you're going to have this, like, hot little one-night stand where you fuck him. And, like, the lead into that is, like, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. But then, you know, he, like, brings this, you know, fox home. And the fox is like, no, 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 no. I'm not the one on bottom turnaround. <laughs> <laughs> Blender did fan art for that one. Aw. Yay, Blender. Um, what other... But, I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean... I mean, the way... If, basically, you know, regardless of the situation, regardless of the stereotype, if you feel like writing a story about something, write it. Yeah. I mean, that like, to start with. But, yeah, I mean, I've had things like, I mean, hell, my whole body of work is pretty much based around the fact that, you know, fighting the perception that gay people can't have normal relationships. Yeah, there you go. Or, um, so, was... I mean, something especially like, do you turn yourself on? I mean, that's a great starting point for a story. I started uh, Miracle on 34th Sheath by, <laughs> with an I am conversation with you. Cam Hirosaki mm-hmm. about um, a carnivore arguing with a herbivore that he could give an equally good blowjob even though he has lots of sharp pointy teeth. Ding. <laughs> <laughs> or uh, my 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 pizza fox story is based on you have like the whole stereotypical oh the pizza delivery boy is here and he's late and he wants to make it up to you like right. that is the premise behind that story and of course I have my own little take and twist on it but I mean yeah I mean and what a twist and right. what a twist Kyle did the voice <laughs> of the coyote in the audio version which is available on our feed I believe no it's on it's on, that, on she's, is on it that feed. or Tilo and the desk husky that was the bonus story. I thought that the Pizza Fox story is on our feed. Yes, Tilo and the Desk Husky is uh, the story that is only available on the unsheathed uh, number two, purchasable at the at a furry con near you. But if you want to hear Kyle doing a deep coyote voice, <laughs> I don't know. I just Cam's thought that maybe you know if you if you turn around. It, you could... Okay, but <laughs> can I just suck you off, please? Alright, sorry. Uh, You're far too late I'm not sure that. if it counts as a wall of text, well, not if we lightning round it, but I thank you for reading my email, or at least most of it. No, but we read it all. Wow, speaking of turning yourself on. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I hope to hear from you soon. Thanks. Sai Cheetah. All right. I've noticed that sometimes he puts a the in there and sometimes he doesn't. Yeah. How come he goes, sometimes he goes for a more human name and sometimes he makes it furry? I'm not sure that the Sai Cheetah <laughs> is more or less furry than Sai Cheetah. But, um, thank you guys, as always, for your letters. They are what keep the show going. Yes. They are the fuel that we run on. They are the fire that burns the our oily machine hearts. <laughs> wow, that sounds like a story. Yes. Pyro, finish up that other one already so we can give you this challenge. Yes, it's going to be steampunk robot furry sex. Oh, we already made him write robot furry sex. We did make him write robot furry, yeah. so maybe it'll just be steampunk clank sex. <laughs> Here's a st- Drive your piston harder. <laughs> Uh, unsheathedpodcast at gmail.com is where you send your emails. If you would like to follow us on FA, we are unsheathed on FA. You can follow me specifically as Kyle, K-Y-E-L-L, and on Twitter as Kyle Gold, and on Live Journal as Kyle Gold, where I just posted the introduction to my next brand new world, which I'm having a huge amount of fun writing. And, I like my magic fox. He has a picture, too. And you can follow me on all three of the above as Cam Hirasaki. And uh, I am posting a lot more to my journals lately. A lot of it's about Summerhill, but I've been just talking about things like writing in general. And uh, there's been some good discussion, so uh, hop on by and see what the hubbub is all about. Bub. (laughs) That bitch. (laughs) (laughs) Yay, we did it again. Uh, Good night, everyone. Keep writing.